everyone but the boss. <laughs> yeah. So now I'm going to be quiet, and you can start to film now. So thank you for inviting me. Uh, so my name is Dean Alexson, and I'm from the Lidenius University in Kalmar. Very nice to be here. Uh, I'm going to present to you two methods that I've used to uh, measure preferences in stakeholder groups. And I hope that... And I'm, um, I'm going to first present them, of course, and then uh, give some examples from studies that I've made within the Swedish steel industry. So this is going to be quite steel-based. I hope that's okay with you. Just examples. So um, the methods uh, that I've used, I'm going to start with this one. It's called conjoint analysis. It's a method uh, that has uh, several advantages um, from a, a perspective when you want to identify preferences of stakeholders. Uh, first of all, um, you can use it uh, since it's, uh, it, it uses a trade-off. It forces the respondent to make a trade-off between factors. Uh, the alternative would be to have a questionnaire of some sort where you make the, the respondents value each factor one at a time. But then you always have the possibility for the respondent to um, sort of put all the factors on the positive side or on the negative side, of course. Everything could be uh, ranked as, as very important. But uh, with this method, the, the respondent is forced to make some sort of trade of to create alternatives. I will show you how in a, in a while. Uh, since this study um, was made in the steel industry, the, the receivers of the results were engineers and they really, really, really preferred to have num numerical results. They were not very fond of qualitative uh, investigations. They wanted to have something that they could show in, in numbers. So a method that where you could use statistical analysis and also numerical results was preferred. Um, also, we wanted to be able to have results on individual level, and this method can produce results on both group level and individual level. So that was another advantages, advantage. And, and it is also possible to combine with a qualitative analysis. So uh, when you collect the data, uh, you do, uh, can also make interviews at the same time. So that's another advantage. Um, the method is from the 60s, something like that. Uh, it it's, um, comes from the words considered jointly, and it's a stated preference method. Uh, so you ask the respondents to state their preference for a hypothetical situation or product. That's the aim of the, of the uh, method. And that means that you can create uh, situations that haven't yet um, uh, seen the daylight. So if you want to, for example, construct a new product, you can use this method to ask um, customers how they will feel about the different characteristics of these products. Uh, so you don't really have to have a, um, an, an actual case, you can construct a case. That's a good thing as well. It's based on a factorial design um, and that means that you pick a number of attributes or factors that you want to investigate somewhere between four and six. Um, I will show you in, a, in just a short a while, what that means, and, and you put them in levels so that um, you can construct this factorial plan. You don't really, if you haven't studied statistics and, and experimental planning, it's no worries. Um, uh, the method has been used in, in many different areas, marketing, transportation, healthcare, and also in environmental valuation since it's possible to draw uh, economic values with this method. I haven't used that possibility, but it is possible to, to uh, create values in, in, uh, in monetary values. So just to give you an example of how this works, you put a, uh, take a bunch of factors, in this case, these ones are my factors, you create a set of alternatives or, or a bunch of alternatives, and, and normally there are more than three, but I just made this so that you could see how the method works. And you ask the respondent to rank these alternatives. So in this case it would be, I would ask you to rank which car would you prefer to buy. And some of you will go for the brand and sort these three alternatives due to what brand you have. Perhaps Volvo, it's, I don't know. Maybe some of you will prefer a Volvo. Some of other of you will, will go for the year. You want a new car perhaps. Some of you will only go for the price. You want to have the cheap one and so on. 
and from, from this ranking of these alternatives you can calculate backwards and see that uh, some of these factors will be more important and some will be less important of course. And then you, you can also, if you want to, calculate where the um, best price is, of course. Um, so, so this is more or less what I do, but I don't do it for cars, I do it for environmental situations. So, um, to show you how this works, I, uh, I uh, will illustrate it with a study that I made in the steel industry, where the problem was that they, had, uh, they have uh, advanced high-strength steels that is better for the environment, um, uh, but people tend to use traditional steel sorts. Uh, so they wanted to know why, what, what factors, what uh, characteristics of the steel makes people buy a certain product. And in this case, we use the container as an example, just to have a product to compare. So I, I constructed eight hypothetical containers with different levels of these factors. And this is the plan, the, the, the experimental plan for, for my containers. So you can see containers A to H and their impact strength, the weight of the container, the chromium content, as, uh, if it was Swedish steel or not, uh, the scrap content in the steel and the price of the container. And then um, I had four different groups, stakeholder groups that were given the opportunity to, to respond to this. It was a web questionnaire it sent out to approximately 800 people and the response rate was quite low, 17%. And that is, there are many explanations to, to that, but one is that this is a quite complex questionnaire to respond to. It takes time and it's quite uh, demanding for the respondents. So here's just a short glimpse of how the result can look. And you see that in this case, Weight was the most important factor for almost all the groups, or for, for all the groups. This should have been connected to the impact strength, but it wasn't really. Uh, you can see, for example, the suppliers are quite low here. They did not feel that impact strength was an important factor when buying a con container, which they, they really should have. But <laughs> uh, you can see chromium content, virgin material, um, Swedish steel and price, they were quite low in comparison and then impact strength and weight were the most important ones. So this is one way of illustrating how, um, how different stakeholder groups um, feel the importance of these factors. Of course, you need to uh, define the factors in advance. So the researcher needs to know which ones are the important factors. And that's, that's uh, uh, the tricky part. So the good things about this method is, is that it's, it's, it's good to identify stakeholder preferences, of course, and it allows for these hypothetical situations. So if you want to, for example, make a decision and, and implement a new decision, perhaps, then you can check this in advance, how the stakeholders perhaps will feel about these different scenarios. And also a good thing that you compare these different factors that you normally perhaps can't compare with a one factor at a time questionnaire. The numerical results is a, is a definite uh, pro thing about this method since the decision makers uh, are most often quite fond of numerical results. Um, and you can both study predefined groups as I did here, but you can also search for hidden groups within the material, see if you find <coughs> uh, preferences based on age or education or so on. Um, on the negative side, it demands quite large samples, so you need at least 100 respondents and, and it's quite difficult to get responses since it's, a, it's a, a difficult questionnaire to respond to. So it takes concentration, there are fatigue effects of course, um, framing effects, how you, how you um, put your alternatives will affect the respondents as well, so there's a lot of things to think about. And the analysis is, is perhaps not uh, something that any decision maker can make. You need some training. So that was one of the methods I've used, uh, conjoint analysis, and you remember this one, I hope. Uh, and I've used another method that is similar in some ways and different in other ways. As you can see, we still have trade-offs between factors, still statistical analysis, 
But in this method, or at least in, in its original um, form, it has non-numerical results, results. So this is more of a qualitative method and only results on group level. It's called Q methodology. Um, the Q methodology compared to conjoint takes fewer samples. So here it's almost um, wanted, um, it's preferred to have few samples. So perhaps somewhere around 30 respondents. And it compares peoples. So, so it, it creates groups of people and say, uh, the method says something about, or the results say something about how these different groups of people, what, what their viewpoints are, their discourses. And it's based on a factor analysis. So if you want to illustrate different viewpoints without having a need to, to uh, quantify it, this is a good method. It's easier for the respondent than the conjoint analysis. And I will show you. Um, you the first thing is that you create these statements. Um, it could be, in this case, it's in th this is the case of the, for my study. These are, as you can see, environmental <coughs> aspects from the steel industry. But it could just as well be statements like, um, I agree that sustainable development is important. So it could be phrases. And you have a, a set of these and you create a sort of game board. Um, and as you can see, it's shaped as a pyramid. And that's to force the results into a, a normal distribution, of course. And you see that this is um, from one to seven, or you can put any number here, but it's from do not agree and to totally agree. And the point is that the respondents, they get these statements on cards. And then their task is to sort these cards into this pyramid. So all of these statements need to go into the pyramid. And then you get points, of course, for each of these, these factors or statements. This is a picture, um, you can't read it, and you're not supposed to, because it's in Swedish anyway. <laughs> but it's from one of, of my respondents. So here you can see what it looks like with these small cards, with the statements written on and then sorted into the pyramid. And from this, it's possible to, to as I said, um, find discourses. We visited, in this study, we visited, visited 10 steelworks and interviewed 38 environmental decision makers. So environmental managers on different, with different titles on these 10, 10 sites. And what we found, and I'm just going to give you a short uh, um, view of the results. Um, I should say, f of course, that we asked, we asked uh, um, three questions. We asked how they perceived the environmental risks for their facility. We asked them what they were worried about, what environmental factors they were wor worried about for their own personal sake. And then we asked them what they actually worked with on a day-to-day -day basis. And they had the same factors from the list here on all three questions. So the point was to compare how they sorted these cards from these three different angles. And just to show you how the results can look, this is from the first question, how they perceived uh, the risks for their facility. Um, the method, the analysis, creates discourses. And in this case, we had four of these viewpoints or discourses. And, and this is one of them. The group that I named Risk Aware, uh, it had eight members, four men and four women. They all worked at ore-based steelworks, no scrap-based steelworks, um, from four different plants all members of top management, and you can see their titles. And what they were mainly worried about was were emission of carbon dioxide. Um, that was really the most important factor for these people. Uh, they also looked at commercial risk. So there were, from the interviews that, that you make, that I made in, in uh, when I collected the data, you could easily find lots and lots of comments on commercial risks connected to both carbon dioxide, but also sulfur, for example. So this was one group. And another group were named economists. They were also focused on um, carbon di dioxide, but also non-renewable resources and energy um, were in their focus. And they focused more on economic risks connected to these statements. So, so this method creates 
groups of people that see these problems in a similar way. So I had four of these courses, but I only show you two of them in this way. Here are the four discourses. This is a bit blurry. Uh, I hope you can understand anyway. So we have the risk aware that we saw, the economists that we saw, and besides those, there were pr practitioners and those that were focused on, on all kinds of emissions. And here are the, f the statements, and you can see that the groups differ. Um, here, for example, emission of dioxin, you can see that there is a large difference between the different groups, these discourses. And then, of course, it's also possible to look at these factors one and one, and here are some pictures where they are compared. Um, the three questions for, this is for noise, so we have perceived risk uh, here, and, and these are the, num the points from the um, pyramid that you remember. And so you can see that most people um, uh, had, had very low personal worry for, for noise, um, but they worked with noise on a daily basis a bit more, and the risk for the facility was also a bit higher, but the personal worry was very low. Oh, we'll, if we look at... Um, <laughs> I don't have it here. We can take um, renewable energy as an example. You see that most people valued renewable energy very low in all three questions, but that the, the, the distribution is higher when it comes to day-to-day -day work and perceived risks uh, for the facility compared to the personal worry. So these are two methods that I've used um, to identify stakeholder preferences. Um, and if we want to conclude the Q methodology as compared to the conjoint analysis, um, we get these viewpoints or discourses instead of the numerical results. We have still have trade-offs between the statements. We study these, can study predefined groups, and, and, but we can also find previously unknown groups. Uh, take smaller samples and it's easier for the respondents. But of course, time consuming for the researcher since every person needs to be visited in person. You have to bring the cards physically. Yes. I think that was it. Thank you. Thank you.